Hello, lovelies. You're listening to episode 40 of the Broken Enchantments podcast, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. That's me. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Be sure to check out my Patreon for next week's episode now available. You can check out the links below. Happy listening. Rolling over in her blankets, Janir tried to block out the voice above. Get up. We leave in less than three hours. Janir cracked her eyes to Drusilla towering over her. The memory of where she was and how she had gotten there came back the same instant. She desperately wished to retreat into her dream. Didn't Cyrillus and Amilla let you sleep? Get up. Drusilla nudged Janir with the toe of her boot. Groggily, Janir pushed herself upright. This early in the morning, she wasn't even coherent enough to realize she should be more compliant. Here. Drusilla handed her a large bundle of something leather and cloth. I think these should fit you. We can't have you in the desert wearing that. The other Argotalum gestured to Janir's brevian clothes. And try these on. They're not quite as weathered as yours. Janir took the blurry objects Drusilla shoved at her and realized it was a pair of boots. There were a few scuffs, but they were relatively new. Now put all that on. I'll be back in a quarter hour, and I expect to see you in those and out of that brevian atrocity. Drusilla then left, the entrance to the tent flapping behind her. Janir held the bundle at arm's length. It was a leather surcoat along with a thin, waist-length chemise, and sturdy tan trousers very much like the ones the other Argotalum women wore. She was being assimilated. Drusilla was playing some kind of mind game, and there was no choice but to go along, yet Janir had no idea what the rules were or how to beat her at it. Janir couldn't win this battle. She reluctantly pulled her green linen dress over her head and pulled on the chemise and surcoat. She hadn't worn trousers before. Split skirts, yes, but not trousers. She decided she didn't like them. They hugged her skin too closely and made her feel exposed. Janir stepped into the snug boots, buckling up the sides. She crammed Seovan's stone under the chemise's collar, hiding it over her heart. She fervently hoped the stone wouldn't show under the leather. Perhaps she should drop it somewhere. If Seovan couldn't find her, then he wouldn't cross the Argotolums. But then she remembered Carl was captive too. Even if she didn't want Seovan to risk himself for her... The tent flap stirred, and Drusilla entered just as Janir fastened to the last buckle on her boots. The Mortana stood back and smiled, as if she were inspecting her daughter before a banquet. Lovely. Drusilla kicked away the pile of fabric that had been one of Janir's favorite dresses. The gesture seemed symbolic, somehow. Argotolum garb suits you. Janir was missing one standard part of Argotolum attire that she wouldn't have minded a belt that held two black rods at her side. The Argotolums disassembled the tents, folding them into impossibly small bundles before securing the bundles to pack horses. Drusilla kept Janir with her for the whole morning, hardly letting her out of sight for more than thirty heartbeats. Janir caught sight of Carl once, unbound, reluctantly helping Cerulius tie the ropes on the pack saddle. The time came for their departure, and Drusilla left Janir with Amilla and the Argotolum called Varser, telling them to make sure she doesn't get lost and wander off. Varser led a little brown mare up for Janir. The mare had a nice expression, kind and gentle, Janir thought. She couldn't help reaching out and patting the animal's sleek neck. This one's Cammy. She's for you. Up you get, then. Varser jerked his head in the direction of the saddle. He swung the reins over the mare's head for Janir and knelt down to give her a lift into the saddle. Instead of leveraging her boot on Varser's cupped hands, she slid her foot into the stirrup and swung onto the mare's back. Mounting on her own was one thing she certainly could do. If Varser knew that that had been her little act of rebellion, he gave no sign. He grasped the mare's reins under the animal's neck and led Janir's horse to stand beside Amilla and her snorting steed. Varser mounted his horse and steered his animal around onto the other side of Janir. Janir held her mare's reins, stroking the leather. 
that old familiar feel that took just a portion of her mind back to when she had been holding Colbo's reins, and all fear of the Argotolums had been a faded nightmare. At least they were letting her ride now. All around them, Argotolums were finishing the final chores of packing up, rechecking the pack horses, and mounting their steeds, while dozens of off-duty, slavish soldiers watched lazily from the fronts of their tents. Janir glimpsed Drusilla, bidding farewell to a squarely built slavish man in the finer clothing of a noble. He had a trimmed, salt and pepper beard, and dark hair streaked with grey. As I said, Lord Hajum, Ivy Down excavations are going as scheduled. Once the relic is in place, your nephew will have the chance to avenge his reputation. Drusilla adjusted her gloves. The boy took it quite hard, the Brevians seizing the mouth of the Criden Road. It will drive him to do better in the next campaign. Hajim, the Slavish Lord, said. And in the next campaign, there will be no question of defeat. Hmm. Should all go to plan? Drusilla backed away from the Von Mar Lord and bowed. I wish you success in your tasks. And you. Farewell. The Lord replied. Drusilla curtly nodded and turned to where an Argotolum held the reins of her horse. Relic, no question of defeat. What secrets were the Von Mars and Argotolums keeping? What were they planning? Janir had every reason to believe it was something magical. The conversation between Amilla and Cerulius back on the Criden Road came to mind. In a short hour, their horses were trekking across the Golden Dunes, Drusilla in the lead. Janir avoided looking at either Varser or Amilla, who rode close on either side of her mare. She managed to catch another flash of Carl for the briefest moment, his spiky hair perched atop a laden pack horse led by Canicade. The Argotolums had intentionally allowed her to see Carl unharmed, of that she was certain. Janir had decided to assume that whatever happened from now on happened according to the Argotolums' plan. That way she wouldn't be surprised if it turned out it was true. They stopped a few times during the day for short rests, then pressed on again. Every step of the animals kicked sand into the air. Soon the sun scorched the ground beneath it. Janir thought it a cruel trick of nature, to make the ground burn during the day and then freeze everything at night. Varser or Amilla, but normally both, kept Janir in their sight at all times. They spoke to her casually, as Drusilla had, playing the same unknowable mind game that Janir still didn't fully understand. At least Amilla was more civil now, but Janir couldn't bring herself to trust it. She knew better. That night, Janir found herself helping Varser rub down the horses. She insisted to herself that she wasn't actually helping him. Just looking after the animals. The saddlebags had already been removed, so she didn't get the chance to search for her carcotton. Janir wasn't honestly sure what she would do if she got a hold of her rods again. She just wanted them back. She avoided having to address any of the Argotolums by name so that she wouldn't have to call them Morton or Mortana, though she stayed under the watchful eye of an Argotolum at all times. She slept in Drusilla's tent again. The woman stirred every time Janir did and twice asked Janir why she kept moving around so much. Janir began to question if Drusilla could dream at all, being such a light sleeper. Perhaps that was a result of being in wars so much. One learned to listen for malignant sounds, even in one's sleep. In some ways, Carl was right. This was just like old times. They were completely at the mercy of Argotolums, and they were both very much prisoners. But unlike before, Janir, not Carl, was the one with value to their captors, and the two were kept entirely separated. Though Janir had to admit that she at least was being treated much better by Drusilla than she had been by her brother. The next evening, Janir was allowed to sit with the other Argotolums by the fire. They ate dried fruit and reheated dried meat that tasted far better than she wanted it to. She stared at the other Argotolums' carcotton and wondered if it would be possible for her to wield someone else's. Though she seriously considered trying, she decided it would be unwise. Lucan had hardly been able to endure the pain her carcotton had inflicted on him, and Janir had seen that her brother had a much higher pain threshold. Besides, how would she escape even if she did get a hold of Carcotton? She'd still have to rescue Carisle and make it back to Brevia. By the fifth night in the desert, Janir was helping to set up the tents, handling tent pegs and hammers, both of which would have made effective weapons, she realized. 
and she still couldn't find her carcotton. One evening, she wondered how long she could keep denying it. She was the Lord Argotolum's firstborn, his true heiress. Death was the only way that she would avoid her future. Sooner or later, she would have to face the inescapable fact. She could flee. She could run as far and fast as she liked. But fate was a patient thing. Like her father. Janir let off a wordless cry. She would be expected to be a cold warrior and detached ruler who would sacrifice whatever and whoever was needed for the good of Argotolum kind. Assuming that was what he wanted. The Lord Argotolum would use whatever means necessary to make her into that person. But he would have to destroy who she was to achieve that and the idea... She would rather die than become who the Lord Argotolum wanted. And she preferred death over very few things. What's wrong? Drusilla asked turning to Janir with an arched brow. They were inside Drusilla's tent, and Janir had been about to lie down on her pallet for the night, while the other Argotolum had been in the corner, mending a strap to her horse's bridle. What was that little sound you made? Drusilla pressed. And that rattling of your head, what was that about? Nothing. I was just thinking. Some rather loud thinking. Drusilla countered, still not convinced. I'm sorry if I disturbed you. Janir apologized. I'll try to be quiet. That seemed to quell Drusilla's questions, though Janir could tell that she was still suspicious as she went back to repairing the bridle. We should be in Sentirith by tomorrow evening, Drusilla dryly stated. The Lord Argotolum should be there today. Janir's hands inadvertently snapped closed, digging her fingernails into her palms. She could feel Drusilla's eyes on the back of her head as she tried not to show just how she felt about that revelation. The Lord Argotolum was the symbol of everything she hated and everything that ruled her nightmares. Do you have any questions? Drusilla asked at length, when Janir remained unresponsive. What's Sentirith? Janir thought maybe that question would distract both of them from what was really eating at her mind. Drusilla scoffed. The capital city of the Vonmars, and by extension all of Slavin. The Lord Argotolum has business there with Sultan Shara Jertash Viri something 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 Vonmar. I always forget his whole name. Oh. It seemed all that she could say. Janir clambered under her blankets, the cold nipping at her exposed skin already. She had less than a day until she was kneeling at the feet of the Lord Argotolum. Sentirith is one of the more modern cities. They have an enchanter temple, the only place our kind are forbidden, a highly respected university, and some of the most skilled healers in the known world. They even have an underground sewage system, much like the one in Adasha. Do you remember? A little, Shinya responded, not really paying attention. She pretended to yawn, rolled over in her blanket, and feigned sleep so Drusilla would stop talking. The other woman gave off a single note of low laughter, and then let silence fall. You have been listening to Broken Enchantments, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. Don't forget to check out my Patreon for early access to episodes, bonus content, and lots of patrons-only freebies. You can learn more at elizabethwheatley.com. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube. I'll see you next time.